Y'all said the Lions won a game. Won a game. Man, we going all the way. All the way baby. We about to celebrate. On, Why? Because the Lions won a game. And we are back. Great Lake State game. football, episode 43, talking everything football in the great state of Michigan. And I am Vince. I'm Corey, and go T-Wolves, baby. We got head coach Dustin Beaver on tonight. And now I'm Brett, and Corey better be putting some chapstick on those lips. He's got hot wings in four days. Which lips you talking about, big boy? <laughs> <laughs> There's his inappropriate remark for the episode. He's fired. You're done. You're done. So as Corey and Brett just mentioned, a couple big things for the episode. First off, we do have a big-time guest. We got repeat guest, Coach Dustin Beaver. Uh, coming on to chat with us about his new head coaching gig with the Northwood Timberwolves. Corey, our co-host Corey here, his uh, alma mater. Very excited. Uh, so Coach Beer, who had been at Albion uh, for 20 years as a player and coach, head coach for the last four years, uh, took the head coaching vacancy at Northwood University uh, to be the next head coach there just three weeks ago. I think he's only been there about three weeks now, so been a pretty uh you know quick turnaround for him to get a recruiting class together and he's going to talk with us about that and in the process of going from d3 to d2 and and uh, everything that he's looking forward to while coaching in northwood and and you'll hear Corey uh swoon uh a few times mm. he's very very excited about coach Bure. and as brett very- mentioned we do have um some uh what, what, what do we want to call it here uh some some comeuppance, punishment. some comeuppance, some some punishment. Uh, uh, you got to reap what you sow. I don't know whatever you want to call it. Corey Corey lost a bet. So this past fall, uh, the three of us had a little competition going. Uh, we had goose poop uh, in our competition. He was not part of this, but uh, we threw his numbers in there. Where each week we picked, uh, uh, I think it was five games. Right, we picked five high school games each week, and we also picked uh, five college football games from the state of Michigan. And Corey lost both. Uh, whoa, 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 it was high close. Though. And... It's not like I got blown out. Relax. What do they say? Close only matters in horseshoes and, and, and grenades, grenades and hand grenades <laughs> or whatever. Uh, you lost. I mean, you lost them both. So Corey's yeah. punishment, as we mentioned uh, in a few episodes this fall when we were doing this contest, he is going to be eating. He's going to be doing the Blazing Wings Challenge. So he's going to be eating the hottest available wings at Buffalo Wild Wings. Uh, I think we're doing six, right? You got to yeah, do six. Yeah. And uh, you, because you lost both, you are not allowed to drink anything, if I remember correctly. Correct. Yeah. And, and I, I think part of the challenge, you can't drink anything anyway. So. And he has to compliment Brett and I, <laughs> alter, alter, alternating compliments between every wing. So I think, what is it, three apiece. Oh, we get yeah. three compliments apiece. So we will be streaming this. Uh, we I'm not sure yet if we're going to record it and upload it or if we're going to live stream it uh, live either stream. on Corey wants to live stream it either on YouTube or Twitter. Both, uh, both of them. Apparently, like, we're going to do both like radios pie. I want both like radios pie. I want both. So <laughs> that will be coming next weekend. Well, from the time this episode comes out in a couple days. So this episode should be up uh, Thursday morning. February 9th, I think this episode will be up, and it will be uh, about two days later, I think, on the uh, 11th. We will yeah. we will have Around Saturday 7 p.m. Up. Eastern time. 7 p.m. Eastern time. We have a date. So <laughs> we'll probably, after this episode drops, probably start promoting that a little bit on Twitter and Instagram. But uh, I, might make, make, I might even make a graphic. Uh, I might make it with Cor- a picture of I, might, Corey. I actually already know what picture to use. It's the one at my house with Corey and the bowls. Going yes. like that. I'm gonna put flame. I'll put flames around you or something, and <laughs> and uh, yeah, it'll be good. It'll be good. So stay tuned for that. Uh, before we get to Coach Bureau's interview here, we do just have a couple of bits of news that we're gonna talk about really quickly. I'll uh, let Corey kick us off here with Division Two. Corey spent a considerable amount of time putting together some pretty cool recruiting information uh, that we put out on Instagram and Twitter regarding the Division Two schools in the state of Michigan. Uh, the GLIAC schools as well as Hillsdale Northwood and the GMAC. Uh, Corey, do you want to talk to us about those those posts on the D2 classes? Yeah, so lots of valuable information posted uh, just to kind of give people an insight of what we're looking at from the broad scope of Division II recruiting in Michigan. So 
uh, just to kind of talk about some key points that was drawing some buzz on Twitter, which we got a ton of love, which is great to see. But uh, Davenport, biggest class at 55 kids, their class does not include um, their transfers. And then you got Fair State coming in at 36, Saginaw Valley with a pretty big class at 35, and then Graham Valley at 32. Do you guys remember the size of the classes you had when you came out of high school? It was in like the low to mid 20s at Graham uh, Valley. I came in with our entire class between the guys that they signed and uh, walk-ons. I think we had 34. I think we signed 20, like around 22 or 23. So we had about a dozen walk-ons. I was going to say, I remember at Northwood, the year I came, we had a humongous class. It was like 50-some-odd dudes, and it was – I mean, by the end, I think there were six or eight of us, so retention was very poor. So we'll see what happens. How many of those guys did, did were on athletic scholarship money, you think? A lot. We brought in a ton of So they guys. must have really spread the money thin then. I don't know about that because I know um, a guy – uh, our right, guy who I played my whole career with, he played right tackle, Dylan Davis. He came up from Florida. He was on a full ride from the minute. It he depends got on how many people that were left on the roster prior to that were on a right. lot of money. I mean, if they graduated a lot. Oh, so. right. If the seniors had True. right freed up a lot of money. True. Yeah. Um, so, yep. So, class size really doesn't mean a whole lot. Um, it does muddy the waters, in my opinion, but. We've talked to um, Coach Sparky McEwen at Davenport. He's got a pretty good recruiting plan. He's been around the block. He's seen a lot of things. So it'll be interesting to see how this class pans out for Davenport. Um, some in- other interesting other interesting information, 263 total recruits to the Division II schools in the state of Michigan, 109, 189 of those 263 coming in this, from the state of Michigan. So that's great to see. That is the majority. And then just filtering in um, by states, Florida, the number two state, which is pretty crazy. Brett pointed that out. Um, kind of shocking. And that's between just Ferris and Davenport. The only two schools that brought in Florida kids. That it's that just tells you how much talents in Florida. I mean, there's not a lot of D twos in schools in Florida, but there's a lot of D one schools and ta- Florida is so talent rich. I mean, like Miami, UCF, Florida, Florida yep. State, FIU, uh, USF, uh, all those schools, most of their roster is from Florida. And then you get like schools in the Big Ten that recruit guys from Florida. And now you got mm-hmm. the GLIAC and the GMAC recruiting guys from Florida. And it's just a very talent rich state. If you look at the breakdown of these type, these athletes that we're bringing from Florida to up to these GLIAC schools, they're all like big body dudes. They're all like 6'2", 6'3", 6'4", anywhere from 300 pounds to 200 pounds at wide receiver or corner. So they're actually all pretty big body kids, which I'd love to do a breakdown of that eventually. Um, but just touching on some other recruiting facts, we got 17 kids out of the state of Ohio, 11 kids out of Illinois. Um, and then shockingly, I just don't know if Indiana football sucks like that or what. No, uh, no knock on Coach Shattuck who came from Indiana that we've interviewed, but uh, five kids recruited from the state of Indiana, which is a, a bordering state to Michigan. So pretty shocking. There's not a lot of D2 schools in Indiana either. I don't know if there's any. Indy. University of Indianapolis. Oh. There's some NA, there's, there's a few NAI schools um, yeah. in Indiana. But yeah, that is a really interesting stat. Vince, I got to ask you, Corey also did the the breakdown by position. Um, being a former fullback, how do you feel about zero <laughs> fullbacks being recruited in the state? Not even one. I I don't know any offenses like off the top of my head that consistently use that as a position. I mean, it's more like Hills, an back type. Right. People yeah, don't really know. call like like Hillsdale uses a fullback with little air quotes because they label it as an H back. Cause they'll put them in motion. They'll put them in the slot. They'll put them at like a wing spot. You know, they won't always put them in like an I formation or a, yeah. an offset or an offset backfield out of a three point stance. Like you don't see that very often anymore. I, one of the schools that comes to mind is North Dakota state. Uh, watch them play some games this year and watch their national title game. North Dakota state, has fullbacks every year, like uses an I formation under center, like old school kind of pro style, you know, offense, you know, with, with, you know, 20 personnel, yeah. 22 I'm, uh, personnel. I'm convinced that the fullback vanished with the crossbar face mask. <laughs> <laughs> to the, to the parent at Grand Ledge high school that used to yell fullback tight end to Vince and I, when we coached, um, 
you, I bet you your son played fullback. So I'm sorry for his recruiting journey, but it's probably pretty sparse. Looking at some other positions, you got athletes coming in at four, but that could really be any position. The highest recruited position was defensive back, which could also be safety or corner. I just compiled or nickel. one. Yep. Or I mean, I don't think there's any nickels recruited, but no safety. People oh, recruit yes. guys as nickels, but there I mean, wasn't any. I mean, it's not spelled out, but I'm just saying there's five yeah. positions essentially that are being recruited. Because I know that some people are talking about how is offensive line not the most recruited. Uh, there's five positions. Well. Defensive backs is a pretty big umbrella. Yeah, true. Um, so you got 46 DBs, 42 D linemen, uh, 45 linebackers, and 40 offensive linemen. The stat that really stuck out to me by position is 14 quarterbacks. Um, and it just kind of blows my mind. And then when you break it down by state, how I did if you're recruited in Michigan or outside of Michigan, only 10 quarterbacks coming to the Division II level. Which, if you really break that down, okay, add D3 and add D1 from the state of Michigan, you're looking at what? Uh, let's just throw a number out there. 20 kids playing quarterback, maybe 24. Yeah, it's, that's – tells you what position to not have your son play in high school. Don't – daddy's son does not need to play quarterback. Put that boy at O-line or DB, and uh, he might get recruited. So, tons of good information. We posted this all to Twitter. Um, a lot of people were nerding out out of it nerding out on it which we loved um i will be releasing later this week really a breakdown of who i think has the best class based on type of athlete i'm going to do all the read readings on um all the classes and watch the coaches videos so we'll be posting i'll be posting top class in the state of michigan um won't be any bias towards northwood and coach Buer, but um yeah other than that that's really all i got on the stats what do you guys think about Northern Michigan only getting 13? I mean, at least when you post this, I don't know if they've had any late signees because guys can continue to sign. So I don't know if they've gained any more. But at the time, on February 3rd, they had only 13 guys signed for their freshman class. If I was them, I would and have, have And they have a new coach, too. They do have a new mm-hmm. coach, too. So kind of like similar to Coach Beer, I think a quick turnaround for that staff. And they're traveling far. I mean – they got seven guys in Michigan, four in Wisconsin, which is their mm-hmm. next closest state to get to. And then they got two in Illinois. Michigan Tech and Northern both got two guys out of Illinois. So I don't know if they have some sort of connection, those UP schools, to get Illinois guys or what. But I just know if I was Northern Michigan or Michigan Tech, I would pack up my suitcase, move to Wisconsin for a month, and strictly recruit all those kids going to Whitewater, Lacrosse, Blase, Blase, Blah. Don't let those big bodies go D three. Give them the money to come up to Northern Michigan. Guess what? You would be relevant real quick. I'm surprised they don't have more Wisconsin guys than what they signed four apiece. Mm-hmm. I I would have thought too that they would get more. Like like you just said, the only scholarship athletic scholarship in Wisconsin is Madison going Badgers. So I'm kind of surprised they don't I think, get more. I think in Wisconsin it's a little bit different of a culture though. I think the those guys like take pride in their D three schools, and it's something right. that they strive to do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like people in Wisconsin are very passionate about their teams. Like they have yeah, the yeah. Bucks, which people are passionate about. That the Packers, which I mean, obviously those people are passionate about the Packers. Wisconsin, they got one D one school they're passionate about, at least for football. Uh, I think they just have a, a true passion for their schools in their state. Yep. Nope. Valid point. We want to talk a little bit here about uh, Wayne State's new head coach, unless you have anything else you want to talk about with the recruiting? No, let's do it. Tyrone Wheatley. Wayne State, big time hire. I think we all texted each other when this got announced. Um, what day was this? Uh, a few weeks ago, I think. Yeah, February 2nd was the press conference at Wayne. Detroit News had the article on February 2nd when he, was, uh, when he did his press conference. So, yeah, just within the last week. Just over a week. Um, so I wonder how that worked with recruiting. Do you think that uh, the coaching staff that was already there in place? Um, I'd be just yeah. be curious to know because uh, what did we say they brought in? They brought in twenty guys. Um, now I don't know how quickly they announced that to guys coming in. That's to me that's a big recruiting tool right there. I mean, what a resume. Tyrone Wheatley. I mean, they literally hired him from the Denver Broncos. Like, I know he's a position, he's a position coach, but still to be D two school in Michigan 
to hire, you know, a very notable University of Michigan football alumni who's had a considerable career playing and coaching is that's a big time hire. It's, His uh, resume is mint, though. Yeah, it's a big statement for Wayne State. Um, I mean, he's a Detroit guy. Uh, so that's cool. He's going back to his hometown. Um, I'd be really interested to know how that came about because I'm sure he was making a lot more money in the NFL. Uh, granted, I don't think money is in his fifties though. I think he's 51 years old at this point in his life. His kids are getting older. He's probably made his money. If he was smart with his money, he's probably not hurting for money. So I I think I saw in his, in, in an interview or a quote from him that he's ready to come home. He wanted to come back to Michigan, come back to Detroit. So, So I mean, yeah, I mean Wayne State's one of the Wayne State is the biggest D two school in the state um, enrollment wise. I don't know if there's any rumors about them transitioning to D one, kind of like we had heard with Grand Valley. So maybe that's his plan is to take them from D two to D one in that transition and be successful. But certainly an interesting hire. I'll uh, be interested to see how it plays out. Um, I know they weren't very good last year, so you know, we'll see what he can, what magic he can work up. They really only, other than the 2011 national runner-up, I mean, they really didn't have much other much success outside of that season. I think they only had a couple other seven or eight win seasons. I don't even know if they ever won more than eight games in a regular season schedule. Because even that year they went to the national title, they were eight and three. And they also had an NFL running back. Yeah. No, he was the he was not on that team. Oh, he was in twenty ten. Uh, Joyke Joy Bell was uh yeah, missed it by one year. He missed it by one year. They had that stud linebacker. Yeah. Who um a great old line too. Yeah, the linebacker who I think got a shot in the NFL. I can't remember his name. He was a big, he was a big dude. He was a Middle Eastern guy, right? No, he was right? middle, no, he wasn't. No, no. Was. But um yeah, big time hire. It'll be interesting to see how that goes with Wayne State. Obviously, Northern Michigan hired a new head coach. We've talked about, and we're going to talk with Coach Beer here, new head coach at Northwood. So, some new coaches abound in our D two schools here in the state of Michigan. Uh, Brett, a lot of new faces. Oh, in sorry, D2. go ahead. Yeah. yeah, I was going to say a lot of new faces in D two. I know you're going to transition us to D one. Uh, there's been some re-signings in D one. First off, Central re-signed Coach Jim McElwain uh, through 2026. Uh, making more than a million dollars a year. I think overall that's a good hire for Central to keep him there. He's done a lot of good things. Um, How many years he has, has he been there now? Oh, shoot. Probably like four. I think it's like 2019 or 2018. Um, probably about five years. And that would make sense. I think about four-year contract sounds right. But anyways, I mean, he's done a lot of good things. I know they had a lot of attrition this year and some injuries. So I expect the chips to be better next year than they were this year. Uh, Michigan. Uh, as everybody knows, Harbaugh is coming back, but he's starting to fill out his staff um, with the firing of Coach Matt Weiss. Um, they replaced him, his duties from the quarterback coach with Kirk Campbell, who um, was spoken highly of last offseason by J.J. McCarthy. Um, he dedicated a lot of his success to Kirk Campbell, um, who's getting promoted from an offensive analyst to the QB coach. Uh, Chris Partridge is coming back, which is a huge hire. Partridge was – one of the, I think he was recruiter of the year in like 2018 in Michigan. Um, he's got some deep roots in New Jersey, coached at Paramus Catholic, uh, high school of Rashawn Gary and Jabriel Peppers, both five stars that came to Michigan. Uh, he spent some time in the SEC, uh, with Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss, so you know he's got some deep roots, deep roots in the south now. Uh, Ole Miss signed a new DC, I believe it was from Bama, so Partridge essentially lost his role and he's coming back to Michigan. Um, I think he's going to coach linebackers, uh, but nonetheless, front maybe not from an X's and O's, but from a recruiting perspective, that's a tremendous hire for Michigan, who's been struggling, um, like okay. struggling with quotes in the recruiting ranks. Um, and then Corey, his buddy, uh, Josh Synagoga, Synagoga, Synagoga. Uh, Corey used to snap balls to Synagoga at Northwood. Um, he's had a number he used of to stops. snap Corey's balls. Yeah, he's coming, <laughs> uh, coming to Michigan. Uh, as an offensive analyst, um, kind of so crazy moving. between him and that Kirk Campbell, a couple former GLIAC guys. That Kirk Campbell was at Tiffin at one point. Oh, when Tiffin was still in the GLIAC. So two D two guys that Michigan's bringing in two D two and uh, uh, because this Kirk Campbell played at Mercy at Mercyhurst, which is another D yeah. two school. So kind of cool seeing D two guys working their way up. GLIAC it guys, cool. 
Um, yeah, and then uh, otherwise, you have Max Schools. Western, the, really the big news there recently is a running back, Sean Tyler, um, who is one of the top rushers in the MAC, uh, is going to Minnesota to play for P.J. Fleck. So I don't think P.J. Fleck would have recruited Tyler. I think he would have been after Fleck's time, but he's fouling. He said, row that, he said row that boat over here, baby. Row, yeah, row that boat. <laughs> row that boat, baby. And then uh, I know we've been tweeting about it, but EMU fouled up their Idaho Bowl potato win, or Idaho potato bowl win uh, with the top recruiting class in the MAC. Um, so it's good for the Eagles. Which is funny because we had mentioned this, uh, when they were on the verge of eight wins or whatever, and then we looked it up and we we're like, "Oh, never mind, they fell way off." And then they ended up pulling it off. Yeah, so it was good to see. Yeah, and then not not a lot of news out East Lansing. Uh, it's been pretty quiet since uh, National Signing Day, but no movement in the coaching staff, which one could argue is a good or a bad thing. I personally think Scott Hazelton should have been fired, um, but there's some people that want to retain him. Panthers, Corey, what do you got for Corey, us? Corey, yeah, you want to get into pro football? Yeah, so we got the Michigan Panthers getting ready for this season. They just released their schedule. Uh, in our great – what's the word I'm looking for? It's very good for the state of Michigan. They'll be playing at Ford Field, which we will get to enjoy. I feel like Michigan you're Panthers. underplaying this. I feel like we should be excited. The I mean, Panthers. I don't love – I don't love I mean, that they're playing at Ford Field, I'm going to be honest. I just – I think it's interesting to hype a little bit. I mean – Ford Fields for the Lions. They need to yeah. play somewhere else. I just else. think there should be a little bit of excitement that the fact that the USFL had a somewhat successful enough season that now in season two they are going to move to other locations outside yeah. of that you know that that hub. They tried to keep it in one hub in the first year, so I think there should be some excitement that if if this keeps going, get some momentum. Maybe there's more in the future. Maybe they will eventually get their own facilities. Who knows? I mean, I don't know. Well, if the some... USFL is watching this, they should move the Michigan Panthers to Grand Rapids. So there's that'd be, that'd be sweet. That'd be sweet. I don't I, know what just, they put it, but it's so hard for me to get hype about football in the spring It's so hard. <laughs> um, isn't the, isn't the uh, Dallas Cowboys returner Turpin? Isn't he, didn't he tear yeah. up the USFL last year? And now he's on yeah. NFL roster. So that, that's a cool story. Um, but you know yeah. we all what else we got on the horizon though is the XFL is like on the horizon of starting again next year. Is that uh, next year? Yeah. I, I think there's a Detroit team. But anywho, yeah, Michigan Panthers. Um, there is actually a Northwood alum, Chris. Oh Jesus, I'm gonna butcher it. Chris Williams, I think. Chris something. Anyway, he just signed with the Panthers. Um, so he will be on the Panthers team this year, or at least he is as of right now. But games start uh 416, they go through Father's Day weekend, so June 18th. They have games kind of all over. So game in Memphis, game in Canton, like we said, a bunch of home games. Uh, they play down in Birmingham. We are going to plan um, to go to a game. We Brett just has to get the official word from his lovely wife if what weekend works best. Uh, maybe We're we can looking at one of the May games, I think, right? Or May. Yeah, yeah maybe May. We'll do a little fan meet and greet, get some – Brouhaha's at a brewery in Detroit. Great Lake State Football Live from USFL. Maybe they'll just let us go in the booth. They don't, there can't be a lot of media covering <laughs> the Michigan Panthers, so maybe we'll get dibs on it. Dude, this could be our first media right ask. <laughs> Am I keeping this in the episode? Corey's excited. Hell right yes. <laughs> Sorry, that, you told me to get more excited. But, uh, yeah, so Michigan Panthers um, – we're going to be at one of the games, so keep an eye on that. As for the Lions, uh, new running back coach Scotty Montgomery was brought in from the Colts. Deuce Staley left us uh, for Carolina to be reunited with uh, um, a previous coach that he had coached with. And then one other question for the group, NFL draft approaching, seeing some mock, draft com- mock drafts come around. What's your guys' take? We got two picks in the first round. Who? Do, what do we have to go get? I think you got to get a, a somebody on defense. Whether it's right, a, the defense was two the of them. weak spot. A right, linebacker, uh, a stud, stud, another stud defensive lineman. Um, I don't think. I think offense. De- you don't think we need a defensive that. back? I thought the passing game was. I don't love drafting DBs in the first round. Right. Yeah. I'm not saying, okay, if you're asking, you're asking for about a first round pick. Um, yeah. We have yeah. two of them. Right. Uh, I think rookies that have impacts are positions that are not defensive back or quarterback. Like linebacker, you can have immediate effect. 
D line, you can normally have a pretty quick effect. Offensive line is tough unless you're a stud. I mean, that running back, they need to draft another running back, not in the first round. But I mean, to answer your question, Corey, it needs to be uh, somebody in the box on defense. Yeah, that's kind of I, my take. Yeah. I think, I think you go get, in my opinion, that first pick, you go get best available D tackle DN, right? Um, a guy who's ready to play. And I didn't I think, think our linebackers best. were that bad. We were just kind of young. I mean, Anzalone and and um, Rodrigo, Rodrigo Malcolm <laughs> Rodriguez, or whatever. I know that you know those are young guys. So I mean, probably. I mean, obviously, we got more linebackers than just the two of those guys. So I don't know what. Yeah, you know what's behind them coming into next year. So I, I yeah, I, I agree with Brett, and I, I think something in the box, D line or linebacker is probably best bet. And I, I always think you got to have a good old line. I know that they had some, some, some of their best. You know, it's kind of one of their better groups, but we had a lot of injuries. So I don't know what's what that's looking like coming into this season if we're going to need someone else on the offensive line. But so Alex Anzalone is thirty, I think thirty one or thirty two, and he's a free agent. So he potentially is gone at linebacker. Um, I think you could up upgrade his position, not necessarily upgrade today because he's a really good camaraderie guy and like a leader in the locker room. But I think you could upgrade his position in the draft. As for the O line, Vince, you're right. Good O line, right tackle or right guard was out all year um, with a. I think he got back surgery actually. Uh, Big V. So he might be back. I think he signed for one more year. I don't know if he's retiring or what. Um, but I tie. Yeah. yeah, big V. So that's all I got for the Lions. Fingers crossed. Make the right decision, Brad Holmes. Well, with that, I think we're going to go ahead and transition to the interview. So stay on here. We're going to be talking with Coach Buer, uh about his transition from Albion College, from their head coaching position to accepting the open head coaching position at Northwood University. We'll be talking about that transition and uh, what he's looking forward to in the 2023 season. That is coming at you right now. Going to go ahead and segue into the interview portion of the podcast here for episode 43. And tonight we have on repeat guest, Coach Dustin Buer. We had Coach Buer on a couple months ago as the head coach at Albion College. Uh, we talked with him right before he was going into a big showdown with Coach Couch and Alm. Obviously, that didn't fortunately go the way of the Albion Britons, but still a heck of a season nonetheless at 9-1 and one and the three of us, or the two of us, three of us, I was talking with Corey and Brett. We were actually really disappointed and kind of shocked that uh, the MIAA didn't get two playoff bids this fall. We thought with, uh, you know, your guys' strength of record, we thought you guys had a heck of a record, even with that very close loss to Alma. We thought for sure the MIAA was going to get two playoff bids. But coming off of four seasons as the head coach at Albion College and damn near two decades, I think, between the player, assistant coach, head coach at Albion College, now uh, moving on to the Northwood Timberwolves. Coach Buer, how you doing? Doing fantastic. Um, my son, during the interview process, when he caught wind of Northwood, he's, he's six, and he's pretty much like, and I, hopefully this isn't like a, like a thing that I get jinxed. I don't believe in curses, guys. So like that 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 week leading up, this this podcast is not why we lost. I don't think anyway. Oh, geez. this isn't a sign of things to come. I don't need Corey coming after me. Uh, nope. But like after we, <laughs> I'm going through this process. My son's like, "Why do they want you? You lost." And then it was like, uh, <laughs> "There's got to be someone better. You lost." And the only reason this is happening is because you lost. So I dealt with like the harshest critic at home, minus probably them you know, alums that wanted to, you know, not, not be happy with me and stuff. So uh, <laughs> we, we had a heck of a year though, man, it was, it was an awesome group of kids. And I think it's a great learning lesson. Things I talked to our team about this morning here at Northwood of like, you can work really hard and do all the right things to put your, but it just, cause it's going to give you the opportunity to be in that situation. It doesn't mean it's going to happen for you, but right. I can tell you one thing, if you don't do those things, put yourself in a situation it's never going to happen for you and I think that's where we're at right now here is guys you know you got to have an undying belief in the unknown of what you go after and what you want and what your vision is and you got to have the work output to match that and uh, match your vision and not just focus on the vision side of things because you'll get frustrated a lot along the way um so I, I mean that's that's kind of where I was at. I mean, I love that group of kids. That was the hardest thing I've probably done in my life was uh, say goodbye and, and how the timing of it and having to do that online. I still hear from some of those guys. Uh, 
And because it's special relationships, man, when you're with winning, winning team and you have a winning culture, those relationships are different. It's just a different thing that you leave with different feeling. Yeah. So what, obviously, you know, you're going to always try and find opportunities to, you know, keep moving up, especially as a coach in the co- world of college football, there's always, uh, you know, those, that, that itch you got to scratch where you got to try and find the next great big challenge, uh, you know, whether it's as a head coach, assistant coach, or as a player. So, you know, obviously, as you just mentioned, very hard to leave Albion, but uh, what was it about Northwood that was maybe the right fit or the, the right, you know, the right job to draw you away from, uh, you know, a place that you've spent, uh, what, half of your adult, your life, half your adult yeah, life? Yeah, more much? than half. I've, yeah. I've been around Albion probably longer than I lived at home with my parents by the time it was said <laughs> and done. And um, really, there were there were some commonalities. I think number one thing you want to look for is the people that you're around and who you're going to surround yourself with. I did think like the athletic department here at Northwood through the process was uh, we had a special group and unit at Albion, uh, but there was the right people in place. You want to look at like, what's the vision of your boss? Um, and, and Jeff Curtis being a successful coach while he was here at Northwood, even though it was in a different sport and an athletic director who has coached in the past, understanding the challenges that you're going to face and those types of things, things that you need um, and help you understand where some challenges could be opportunities for you. That was a major draw. Uh, Kent McDonald, the president, um, when I met with him, you know, how many presidents do you come in and meet with? And he's just, he's got blue jeans on, man, just like a normal dude. Uh, he's from Canada, you know, oh, he's, man. he's tried to increase the, uh, he, he's tried to increase the game day atmosphere at, at Northwood with the hospitality area and the end zone and things like that. And yeah. uh, well, he told me he wanted to win. Like I want to win. And now yeah. the thing is, all right, it's all cool to say that you want to win, but here are the things that I'm going to need for us to win. Right. You know, and, and they hadn't hired, outside of the program in a long time, right. As you know, since coach Reitma mm-hmm. has been, it's been in that tree. And I had to make sure they understood number one. Like I I've said this a million times, there's only one Pat Reitma. Like he, he, what he was able to accomplish with little to nothing, you know, to work off of and, and what he was able to accomplish in the GLIAC back then really, really impressive. Uh, he's an icon around here. I'm, I can't be him. I got to be my best version of myself. Um, and, and and they bought into that too. Like they don't want they don't want me to be him. You know what I mean? I think they'd like to see someone duplicate the success he had. Um, and we're gonna work our, our butts off to try to do that. So that was a draw. Knowing that they had had success in the past, like hey, it can be done there. I think I had access to a lot of people behind the scenes. Uh, whether it was guys who competed against them in the past. Uh, the vibe I'm getting is people look at Northwood as like has been like a sleeping giant for a while. And, and like if you get the right you get the right mojo going and, and the right attitude in the recruiting side of things, um, all those types of things, then special things can happen here again. So I saw that as opportunity. Um, I think another draw for me, honestly, is like you said, you, you get to move up. Right. And I don't know that I'd have been able to sit at Albion knowing like I have accomplished, I, I was able to, unfortunate to work with great people, have great players to put me in this position, but I accomplished a lot. I've been there a long time. Right. And I don't know if I wouldn't have, would have been able to sit there and not wonder what if, if I didn't take this opportunity, you know, you know how it is in coaching when you, your stock's only as high as it's going to get, you know, and you got to take opportunities when they were there. And I turned down opportunities in the past when I was an assistant and stuff. And um, it was the right time. Midland's a great community. That was a draw for my family. Um, you know, uh, that, that was a huge draw for us to come up here and, and understand that, that my kids are going to have a little bit more available to them um, within their education and, and recre- recreational opportunities. Uh, so that was a draw. Um, and then academically a fit, you know what I mean? I, I think it's uh you went to Hillsdale, Corey went to Northwood, you know, Brett probably went to one of the better public institutions in the state. You know, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not going to ever hate on public institutions. I'm, I'm not trying to sound like a private school snob. All right. So that's definitely not what I'm going to do. But I, I think like when, when you have a, an idea of what, how the private school setting works and those types of things, it's easier to fit in. And then you couple that with like geographically, I'm not uprooting my family to, you know, middle of nowhere. Uh, I'm not trying to make fun of any state. So pick any state. Anywhere. <laughs> Ohio. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, could be there. Could be there. Um, so like not uprooting the, and, and having a geographical understanding mm-hmm. of the recruiting scene and, and having those connections already. There was a lot of pieces that went into the puzzle. And, um, you know, when I challenged and, and, and said, hey, I think, you know, for me to do this, 
And I thought I, I knocked myself out. I needed like X, Y, and Z to happen, right? I think one thing you got to create an environment where you can have staff continuity uh, and, and, and not have turnover in those situations. Um, I don't know that that's been easy in the past here. Um, and they, they did that, right? You know, I got, I got to be able to move my family up without knowing if my wife's going to be able to be an administrator anymore, you know, um, uh, with the commitment to um, – on the fundraising side of things, right. And a commitment to scholarships and thinking outside the box on stuff yep. were a lot of things that had to check the boxes and they checked the boxes. That tells me you want to win. You know what I mean? Yep. It's just saying it, you got to back it up with action and they did those things. And how do you say no at that situation? And then it was about getting my family across the finish line. Um, and so I brought them up after the official offer came and, uh, you know, my son was the hardest recruit and the hardest sell, the oldest one. He thought he was mad because the Timberwolf doesn't have a sword and a shield uh, like Britt did. And like, I don't know if you've seen Britt. He's kind of goofy looking, pretty sweet, but goofy looking. Uh, but like, you know, oh, it's a wolf, man. He doesn't have a sword and a shield. And then I take him into the indoor on that visit. And I joke with the AD now, like two days before that, we went to Ford Field to watch the Lions play the Vikings. So like his idea of an indoor is Ford Field, right? So we get in their indoor and he's like, I can tell he's digging it, but he's trying to hate everything. You know what I mean? And uh, so I'm like, you like this, buddy? It's pretty cool. He's like, uh, yes, yeah, it's all right. It's not the best in the world. You know, Ford Field's better. <laughs> like, yeah. All right, brother. So it's so like uh, just putting that into perspective, <laughs> toughest recruiting job I've ever had. Ugh. EJ Arnold, uh, assistant that I kept, uh, was going to be the associate head coach, ST's coordinator here. Uh he, he knocked it out of the park with my family on the on the community tour. My son wanted to know if there was a target. Bam, he showed him target. It was done. It was, it was, that's how it was the deal. And, uh, you know, how, you know, most, you know, late 30, early 40, white women like target a lot too. So that's, uh, you know, we don't have to drive 25 minutes to get there. So, uh, yeah, there were a lot of positives. Man. So I think I just listed off 40. I'm excited for it. And just a new opportunity. I, I we ask our kids all the time, like to challenge themselves and put themselves in uncomfortable situations. And I'd have been a fraud if I didn't try to do it myself. So they, they didn't even have to offer you a salary. They could have just told you target is in Midland and you're on board target, indoor facility, ready to target, go. Target indoor facility. I mean, like there were other things like, uh, you know, division three level, you're at the beck and call of the professors with your practice times and things like that. Like here, they're having activity block two to six. Like, so, you know, two o'clock we're meeting three o'clock. I'm going to practice. I'm going to be able to sneak home and eat. I've never had a Tuesday or Wednesday evening dinner with my wife since we've been married. Oh, wow. with My children. All right. So that's awesome. And that's a long time. And like, so be able to sneak home and do that and then come back to the office if I need to and get stuff done. That's huge. That's like life changing stuff. You know what I mean? Like that's something that little. Um, so there was a there was a lot of things that just, hey, there's some good opportunities. And I always worked really hard at recruiting. I don't know if I'm worth a damn at it, but um, we try. I try hard and and to have the opportunity to have scholarship money and recruit with that. And then in an ever challenging world of recruiting was uh, something I wanted to take a stab at. Well, Coach, so I will speak oh, up real quick, Vince. As an alum, I'm super excited that you're here. <laughs> um, I did come out and say, hey, we needed to clean house. We need to go in a direction. They did that. So I'm a big fan. So I'm hoping not to disappoint you, man. We're going to work hard. We're going to work yeah, hard. You got, you got some time with me. I'll be there. You're, all right. You're, all right. Put, you're always welcome, the, brother. Corey's yeah. putting the high expectations live on air here. He's putting, hey, he's putting it up there. Sky high, baby. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong nope. with that. So after spending uh, so much time with Albion, and I know you had a stop in between there, uh, I think it was Moorhead State, right, for a couple seasons. So so you did uh, get an experience for a couple of years at another school before coming back to Albion. Um, obviously, a lot of time at the Division Three level, MIAA. We here on the podcast, we love talking about the MIAA, love talking about the GLIAC, and obviously Northwood and Hillsdale and the Ohio schools moved into the GMAC. Uh, so we got two D2 conferences now in the state of Michigan, but uh, – what have been some of the biggest, you know, um, kind of learning curves or, or you know, toughest uh, parts of your job now moving, making that transition uh, from from Division three to Division two? There's, you know, obviously, you know, things like athletic scholarship money is the big thing that comes to mind. But I'm sure there's other things that maybe people aren't aware of or the you know, average person might not realize taking on that job. What a big step up or, you know, learning curve it might be in different areas. Yeah. 
different some different eligibility standards you know that you're that you're paying attention to it's not so much institutionally there's the like set rules by the division right i think that's that's one i'm getting the hang of you mentioned one the scholarships it's not only what your scholarship budget is it's what your equivalency number is so if a kid's getting x amount he's that against the equivalency count and and so like i yeah, you got to be like the general manager of your team like you're you're in charge of like okay this is where we're at. This is what we have. This is what's outgoing. This is what's incoming. So I'm, I think like my wife would never let me um, do our banking at home. Um, so uh, <laughs> that's not to make anyone from Northwood associate with Northwood scared. I've always been able to balance budget at, at work and I've always been able to, I think I'll be fine when it comes to scholarships because it comes down to winning and losing. I guess at home does too. And that's why she takes control. Right. So um uh, <laughs> So like those are different. I think there's a lot more um, opportunity for me in the off season. There, there's uh, I'm going to be able to be around the, the guys a lot more. And, and unfortunately the last few weeks has been like, we had three weeks together as a staff. There was like two, me and coach Arnold were doing a lot for the first couple of weeks until I got guys flown in and in town. And then coach Burton, when he jumped on board uh, to coach the offensive line, Drew Burton lived in Freeland. So us three were kind of, all right, let's guide the ship. Let's get things rolling. And then when guys started getting dumped in town, it was three weeks of just fast and furious to signing day. Um, so um, that was an adjustment deal. I mean, I, like I told people, like we were doing a, you know, a one year process in a three week sprint, man, like a, a sprint and a marathon. And, and, and so, um, you know, me and Corey know a lot about marathons because that's that we got that bill, right? Corey. Yeah. So like, I'm we're training all, for one. Yep, you're training for one. Me too. Allegedly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna train for an eating one or something. So <laughs> um, but there's there's those. But I think the unique things like I look at it as positive. I could be around the team more than what I had opportunities to in the uh, off season with division right. Three. Yeah, you're far more limited at the Division Three level. Yeah, way more limited in what you could do. I can watch the guys work out here. Um, you know, as long as you're staying under your countable hours per week, you know, you can do some individual training side of things with guys. And and I, those are unique, you really unique opportunities that we just you couldn't do at D three. And and it, and and uh, but the other thing too that I'm getting used to is like. Division three, a lot of times you're working games management for another sport. You know what I mean? The only thing I'm mad at Northwood about is uh, they didn't hire me before I worked like the longest wrestling tournament in the, in the school's history, bringing back wrestling at Albion. So like, you know, you're, you're doing a lot of multitasking at, at there where you got a, a little bit more support staff here. Yep. And so it's kind of like there are times I'm walking around like, shouldn't I be at like uh I don't know, some random meeting on campus for some committee or I should be getting ready to take the officials to the locker room for a basketball game. So like those were all pluses to me. Like I, I'm really like, I double checked a million times. Like, Hey, so you're telling me I'm just coaching football. Like I'm, I'm going to be a football coach. And um, they're like, yeah, you're a football coach and a fundraiser for your program. I'm like guys hard to turn down. You know what I mean? So, uh, I, I, a lot of the differences are like, it's, it's, it's cool new opportunity for me. Right. And I think one thing that I always think about too is, you take it for granted at the division one level, it gets talked about all the time, but division two also can have GAs, student coaches who can enter into the master's programs and, uh, you know, still have, you know, be a part of the the coaching staff and you can have your, you know, offensive analysts if you want at the D2 level or your, you know, your uh, whatever other labels you want to put on the GAs for, for your coaching staff, you know, not a lot of D3 schools our universities, so it's hard to get that. You know, Albion College, Adrian College, Alma College. I think other than Trine and Calvin, they're you know they're all colleges. So they don't mm -hmm. have those graduate programs. You know, to give those assistant coaches an opportunity to come in. You know, keep them on your staff as as uh, you know in those student position roles. I also think that you guys, especially at the Division Two level, have probably the harder job compared to comparatively to Division One when it comes to scholarships because at the Division One, they just have a flat out full ride as you're talking about you're managing all these different partial scholarships that you got to kind of split up you got to decide who you give them to how you want to use them whereas division one it's what 80 80 something straight up 85 i, I, I feel like yeah, yeah oh, it yeah. makes to me it makes it even harder at the d2 level for that in terms of that that uh, is process. the one like i just had to like double check a million times like okay equivalent equivalency number all right scholarship budget even though our equivalency might be this as a department here at Northwood, this is the true equivalency number to go off of, but right. this is the budget I need to stay in. And um, it's gone pretty smooth. You know what I mean? It, it's like, um, 
having EJ here as a guy who's had a, plenty of experience at Northwood, God, if it wasn't for him, man, this would be a sinking ship already. Like he knows <laughs> everybody on campus. Like I couldn't imagine living. Like we're always like we always told him that E and EJ. We keep telling him stands for elite because he's like he's like. He's saving the program one day at a time with me, like, and teaching us all what the heck to do. Like, he's wearing a lot of hats right now, and he's um, he's done a heck of a job and been huge, like, getting things rolling. Jeff Curtis, the, the athletic director, has been unbelievable and, and support going and just good people all around, man. So going yeah. in – oh, sorry, go ahead, Brett. Yeah, I was just going to say another thing with uh, recruiting too is you got to make sure that you're underneath your own cap, for lack of better words, but also when you're recruiting – you know, these other kids are getting money from other schools too. So you're playing with the numbers, like how high can I get this quarterback to be, to make him want to come to Northwood when he's getting X amount at Hillsdale or Grand Valley or something. That's just. Yeah, it's, it's tough. And you can get yourself in trouble if you're going to get into a bidding war over a kid, you got to understand when to cut your losses and say, Hey, that's just not going to be us. And cause you can get yourself in a bad situation there pretty quick with your scholarships and get a bad reputation by running guys off and start seeing like 30 guys go in the portal from one place. Like what the heck's going on there? You know what mm-hmm. I mean? You're going to miss on guys and you want to do what's best for the kids too. Like, you know, if it's not the best situation for them, I think you got to have open, honest conversation with them and, and Hey, you're going to have better opportunities somewhere else. You know what I mean? But, and it's the same thing when you're recruiting a kid, I think you want to know, like everybody wants the number to be zero. And I think that's what people don't understand is like, when you're getting recruited D2, like, oh, I just see scholarships, right? Well, hey, brother, like, there's there's technically 36 fulls, and you're not going to just use 36 fulls on 36 dudes. You're not going to be very good, right? So yeah. um, you got to understand how to break that up. You got to understand how to talk the lingo with the kids. And the one thing you got you can't just do is like, okay, this team's going to probably beat us financially. You can't be scared to go recruit against them. And I, I think, like, if you do that, you got to understand when to cut your losses on that, too, like, Hey, we're probably not going to get this kid. I've never seen kids turn this place down, but there's also like some schools where you're like, no, I'll go after him and make him understand the value of what he's going to get here over his four years. And just because I'm right. starting out at this number doesn't mean it's going to finish at this number. Right. It's kind of like signing bonuses. Once you, Hey, it's hard to take money away, but it's easy to add on over your time if you earn yeah. it. Right. So it's kind of a catch 22 of like, Hey, I'm starting you off here. I'm just giving you an opportunity to start it out. You have opportunities to earn throughout your career. And I think people appreciate that upfront and honesty, right? They, they want, they want people in the, the day, just want people to be honest with them, you know? And right. so, but you cannot be afraid to go recruit against people just because you think they're going to be cheaper than you, That you can't do that or else you're going to be now, if it's like a 10, $12,000 difference, you probably, that'd be stupid, but if you're within five to six. Like you got to go in on those battles and, and say, listen, you know, 37% of all Northwood graduates own their own business. It's a pretty good deal. If you're thinking about business, we're in a business focused world right now, mm-hmm. you know, and like it's, it's uh, there's not many people in education anymore. Like when I was coming out, like that was it. Right. Um, I think when I was coming out of school, it was, another thing was, you know, to make money, you had to be a lawyer or a doctor, but who the heck yeah. went to school for all those years. Right. And so <laughs> um, I think people have learned pretty quick. They can sit at home in their Lululemons and wool socks and, and make, you know, 70, 80 K out of college. This is a pretty good gig. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Um, that, that's not for lack of a better term. I like Lululemon too, but oh, they're great. it took me a long time to be able to afford one pair of pants. <laughs> I, oh, I love it. So spe- speaking of recruiting, obviously you guys just announced, you know, we had signing day last week, uh, just had your first recruiting class uh, as the head coach at Northwood. I think you guys signed, not including transfers. I think I saw 20. I think you guys yeah. ended up signing 20 incoming freshmen. Um, so how are you guys feeling about that incoming class? Uh, is there anything particular that excites you about it uh, with this, your, your very first recruiting class at Northwood? Yeah, I'm excited. We were able to get anybody at all in three weeks, right? You know, we're <laughs> that's that's great. That is crazy. <laughs> it is impressive. That's crazy. Uh, went to crazy battles. I think one thing I'm proud of our staff on is not panicking just to recruit for numbers, right? And right. We had to see value in each kid that we brought in, um, even if it was some long term value. Like, hey, might be a red shirt guy. We'd like to red shirt a lot of them. You know, I don't know if we're going to be in that situation where we can right away. So, um, and with the D two new D two rule, with only you know you get three games before you red uh, burn a red shirt. That's a huge help in that. So, uh, I'm excited with the pieces that we added. Um, specifically up front on the offensive line, we added a few pieces on the defensive line. Uh, I thought we 
offered a, a, a really tough competitive quarterback that I think that a team could rally around eventually in his career. Um, had a great career in high school. A um, couple receivers, you know, three receivers, I think it was. Um, uh, a pretty good uh, hybrid outside linebacker, in our opinion. I think we, we got one of the best all around high school football players in the state of Michigan, regardless of division. Um, and the young man out of Lumen Christie, Joe Lathers, uh, right. yep. quarterback, outside linebacker. But yeah, I heard more about us getting him than, you know, nothing against the other kids. Just like people see value in that dude. Like he's, he's a tough competitive dude. Um, we're excited about that. We got a center out of, um, this will fire you up, Corey. We got a center out of Avon, Indiana. If you watched his film, you're going to be like, Oh Yeah. Yeah, that guy's Good. legit. So uh, we're excited about him, Ty Mead. Um, and then we're still working at it. There's there's some guys that are going to be coming along that we're already aware of that we can't speak about. There are seven dudes that we brought at um, uh, actually mid-year that nobody knows about as well. So, like, uh, we brought in seven mid-year transfers. Uh, we brought in the 20 first years. And then we're going to sprinkle the final pieces on what we need here over the next, you know, four to five weeks or even through the spring transfer portal. I don't want to get the vibe out there that we're going to live in the transfer portal. At the end of the day, though, the first couple of years to get this thing rolling, we're going to have to be in it more often than not. And then we want to start getting to more of the homegrown and using that as a tool to uh, just hit your immediate need stuff. So do you anticipate by the, by the time it's all said and done between the incoming freshmen handful of transfers, I'm sure maybe even a couple walk-ons that'll be in the closer to low mid thirties, probably. I would probably guess more to the low forties. You know, oh, wow. Okay. So that's, so, that's pretty yeah, solid. That's a mid, really good incoming class. Yeah. Thing. Between the mid years, um, the 20, the, between the 27, we had like the 20 new signees and the seven mid years are at 27 there. Um, a few guys committed, you know, uh, already to uh, prefer walk on side of things. And then, you know, with the transfers, we know are committed right now. Um, and I'm not breaking any rules because I'm not mentioning any names and, and the ones that we believe that we have a good shot at coming in still. Uh, yeah, I would say we're going to be in the low forties range, uh, when this is all said and done by name, I hope we can get some good ones. Like, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> that would look good in Navy blue and Columbia blue, man. There you go. Sure. There you go. Got some good colors at Northwood. Those baby great blue color those combo. Are sexy. Dude, those they, great like, color I had combo. a lot of purple, black, gray, Vegas gold in my closet. That I was- like the purple and black though. Purple and black is sharp. Yeah. The purple, I, I mean. I'm always going to be an Albion dude deep down inside. Love that place to death. It's the one that kind of groomed me into a human being. Um, uh, uh, you know, whether people think it was the right person or not, whatever. But uh, my parents are proud, I think. Um, <laughs> I got my wife somehow I tricked her too there. But they, uh, yeah, the navy blue, dude, like the navy blue, Columbia blue, they're, they're sweet colors. You know, I'm kind of going through, like, I think we're going to go to back to the navy blue helmet, get to a little – a little more toughier, grittier nice. look, okay. maybe, you know what I mean? And, uh, yeah, I got some ideas. I got some visions here. Corey, I'd love to get alumni feedback if you got to get an opportunity, you know, and see what you yeah. have to say about that. I like it. Get a, get it. a better helmet than we had. Half my helmet chipped off. My, I, I, that year. might be the ridiculous. one sitting on my desk in here. There's half the blue. <laughs> Was yours the matte blue, matte navy? Yeah, matte blue. And the whole – pretty much from my forehead to, like, top of my helmet was gone. Dude, this might be the one sitting in my office right now. I <laughs> swear God, Corey's looking, old helmet. Yeah, it's looking. <laughs> and on what I'd love to do is like, okay, we earn the opportunity to go back to the Columbia Blue Helmets of the elite mm. Pat Reema years. Ooh. You know what I'm saying? Those are those gotta, are bad. We got to earn. We got to earn it. You know what I mean? That's that's what yeah. that would be like. What we what we have to get to and work for. So eventually, but yes, the yeah. colors are pretty dope. I like them. You know. So and what? I'm order something else other than you know the same colors. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So one more kind of question here on Northwood before we wrap things up. Uh, obviously, kept some staff from the previous Northwood staff uh, and then brought some some new new guys in to kind of fill out your coaching staff at Northwood. Any any uh, comments you want to make or, or uh, you know, evaluations of your staff right now, how, you, how you're feeling with this group going into 2023? Well, I think it's, it's not only unique that you're bringing uh, – trying to bring a team together, right? It, it, you're also bringing a – I think what I think is a really dynamic coaching staff, in my opinion, uh, could we're going to work hard to be one of the best in the country. I think we got the right guys in place, but you're also learning how 
each other's mannerisms, your voice right. inflections. All right. Is this guy getting pissed at me? You know, you're, you're figuring each other out too, and you're blending ideas and stuff, yep. which has been really fun and a little bit refreshing. All right. And so um, I do think we got a great, uh, a great staff. Drew Burton, I think, is an elite offensive line coach. Uh, formerly was at uh, Saginaw Valley. You know, I'd competed against when he was an O line coach at Alma um, and even Wisconsin Stevens Point. Grand Valley alum played offensive line there, a national championship team. Understands the division, the level. Understands like he thinks there's been missed opportunities here in recruiting, and 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 he's excited about changing it. Um, and excited about the guys he has the opportunity to coach here currently on the roster. Uh, EJ Arnold, I think, is an elite special teams coordinator. And he was coaching the offense the last couple of years here, running the offense. I thought he did a, a pretty darn good job, honestly, um, given the situation. But his real loves STs, and he's the associate head coach. That's my right hand man, uh, Justin Sweeney, my defensive coordinator this past year at Albion College, who I'd coached with for six years, came with me uh, up here. Um, really excited uh, uh, to have him on board to run the defense up here. Uh, great recruiter, um, awesome mind, you know. Uh, very meticulous and detail oriented. Uh, Tino Smith was supposed to come with me as well. My wide receivers coach. I don't know if you guys saw, he got hired by Michigan state like four days before he was oh, up here in the North. I did not see so, that. Yeah. And, and unbelievable dude. I have to give him a shout out on this. Like Tino's the man. Um, my kids are devastated. My one son, like I don't tell him what to like or anything. He loves Michigan. He's really pissed at his uncle Tino right now. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, you're not going to say that when uncle Tino like gets you tickets to a game and you realize yeah. like, where your loyalty is at pretty quick. Yeah. So, yeah. um, but then it was, it was, you know, where that happened, I was able to get an unbelievable, in my opinion, receivers coach in CJ Germany. Uh, he kicked around the league a little bit as a player, played at Notre Dame College Division II school in Cleveland, from Cleveland, uh, was recently at Nevada, uh, University of Nevada, Reno out there, uh, working out there with receivers. Um, and, man, he's awesome. He's doing a heck of a job. Um, and then uh, Eric Lattimore, former player at Penn State, was on, like, 2009 Rose Bowl uh, team, was coaching right. Nico D-line out there uh, in California, bringing some of that um, – knowledge out here as well as is is the defensive line coach um has has ties to the east coast west coast and like when you play that level and you got guys all over the country coach and that that helps with recruiting ties and those types of things um jason mirren well uh, recently he's the offensive coordinator at, uh, was at bucknell most recently a lot of fcs experience him ej and i used to work michigan camps back when it was a five-day camp uh, we've known each other for 13 years, just never had opportunity to all work together. And all this stuff came together at the same time. And I'm, I'm really excited about him and his family joining us up here in Midland. Corey Tyslenko is the GA that I inherited. And I'm really happy that I got to inherit that guy. You talk about a guy that wants to win and will do whatever it takes, you know, uh, real fortunate to have him to, to help on the staff and he's going to be working with the tight end. So um, one of my former players, Jack Bush was supposed to come with me. Another plug for him. He got hired last week as the quarterback's GA at, at central Michigan. Uh, really proud of him as well uh, to be able to take the leap into coaching. Uh, so uh, overall, we got a great Corey ringer, um, former player. Right. For Denise, uh, played yep. at EGR was at yep. Olivet, competed against him. Think he's a hell of a coach. I'm seeing the timer working down. we are really excited about Corey <laughs> Ringer. Um, he'll be able to come coach the running backs for us. So I hit all those staff guys up right now. I'm working on finding a, a part-time outside linebackers coach right now that, that uh, fits us. we got a couple guys we're on, and we're, we're going to make a run at it. But I'm really excited about the staff, and it's been really fun, and uh, there's been a great energy around, and just got to change the energy around here. We'll be excited to uh, check out a game this fall, Corey and I, and maybe maybe Brett if we can find it, uh, find some time. We'd love to come come up to Northwood check out a game. I was well, I was at, Coach I Otter was, scheduled us as your as your homecoming, so I was like, hey, I'll dude, that right, tells you that you game. think about me. All right, I see <laughs> Coach Otter. He's like, come on, we had four straight away games. I didn't have a choice, and he also told me I'm not no, no longer welcome back to that uh, academic uh, academic football camp at North or. Uh, Hillsdale anymore now that I'm at Northwood. So, uh, oh, and so he, uh, Coach Otter's a great dude, and, and uh, I'm excited to compete against him. And one of the things you get, you have to get used to is, like, the GMAC, there's only two schools in, in Michigan, right? Right, a lot of traveling. Crosstown axe rivalry with, with uh, Saginaw Valley. Saginaw. Yeah. I think yeah. Hillsdale's your natural in-state rivalry. 
I'm missing counts like dude, the MIAA was a little bit dramatic. And so All I right. watch on Twitter the back and forths right now between the different coaching staffs. It's like I'm just sitting there eating popcorn, watching all enjoying it. <laughs> and not involved in it, not having to respond, not punching my wall in my office like that takes yeah. me off. Um, I've actually had conversations with all the guys like you guys are cracking me up. You guys are so silly right now. You know what I mean? <laughs> so great. I love uh, it. It's been fun to watch. It that unfold and like i'm so glad i'm not getting my blood pressure up right now over that so i got <laughs> enough problems right now well with that i think that'll probably be a good place to end it unless Corey, brett anything else you guys want to add here before we we run out of time t wolves baby i'm high wolves ready. baby let's What's go it right here is it this is this is this what you guys do go baby yep i got you know back Corey. <laughs> I'll take I'll take you out down to Molasses Barbecue downtown. Uh, of Midland. have you been there yet? I haven't been there. Oh, we Ooh. might have to hit that up. I was gonna ask you what your go to spot is to eat. Right now, the calf uh, is great. I think the cafeteria is mm-hmm. this shameless plug. Um, one of my players works at Kidoba. That was my Ooh. my stop tonight. Without my family up here yet, like yeah, I'm literally like. Hey, you can only eat one meal a day because you're probably eating out. Because I, you know, I'm not cooking for myself. Or right. Anything. So, uh, I went to Qdoba tonight for my one meal and drank, you know, f- maybe a pot of coffee during the day to suppress <laughs> appetite. That's the hard thing here, Corey. Shoot, like with the wolf den downstairs, like I smell food mm. in the facility all yep. the time, and it's like that sucks. Like at the Dow and Albion, it's like you didn't smell food, you didn't think about it. Oh, right, man. You like, gotta go, you gotta go to the mid calf and get a I chicken. Did yesterday, wrap. brother. I got a club the, sandwich. Oh, <laughs> baby. The chick <laughs> the chicken wrap at the mid calf is yeah. French kiss. It's so but molasses barbecue downtown has been where our uh, official visits ones have been. And when I had to do two nights in a row because two separate groups came in, I, I didn't feel like I could eat for like five more days. Like I, I'm like <laughs> I love it. I'll take you there for sure. It's a good spot. There's yeah. a lot of hidden gems in Midland, man. It's exciting. Yeah. Well, we're going to keep all this in. I'm going to leave this in the episode. Well, if you were listening, thank you for listening. We appreciate <laughs> Coach Buer. We appreciate your time uh, with us tonight. And uh, hopefully, you, if you were listening on, you enjoyed our conversation with Coach Buer. Stay on. We'll wrap up the episode in just a second. Hope you enjoyed our conversation there with Coach Buer of the Northwood Timberwolves, Corey Zalamater, uh, up in Midland, Michigan. We uh, wish the very best of luck to Coach Buer in the season or this fall season of 2023. Hope things go well. Looking forward to following the uh, Timberwolves in their fir- in their first season under Coach Buer and the GMAC here, and uh, with this class of 2023, see how things see how things go. So. Thanks for joining us, Coach. Hope you enjoyed listening to our conversation with him. Uh, We're going to go ahead and wrap things up here. Uh, We already pretty much talked about everything we needed to before the episode. Just one last reminder, keep your eyes peeled on Twitter and Instagram and YouTube. Uh, We'll be advertising Corey's Wings of Death Challenge uh, coming up this weekend for his uh, losing the bet this past fall. So we hope you enjoy that as well. Uh, go ahead, head over to Twitter if you don't already follow us and give us a follow at GLSF Ball. Follow us on Instagram at Great Lake State Football. Uh, subscribe to us on YouTube. If you like the video version episodes of the podcast, Great Lake State Football over there. Uh, the audio versions are available on all podcast stores, including Apple and Spotify, Great Lake State Football as well. Uh, I'm Vince, episode 43, Great Lake State Football podcast with guest coach, your Northwood co host, Corey and Brett. Go charge. You see this? This is W, baby. I mean W. Yeah, hot, baby.